Real life superhuman strength. We've heard about it, we've seen it in the, in the comic books, you've seen it in the movies. It's a concept of pure fiction. It can never, ever really happen in real life. Or could it? That's what today's video is about. We're talking about real life super strength. I'm not talking about people who are just Arnold Schwarzenegger, strong people that work out all the time, bodybuilders and whatnot. That's pretty impressive. I'm talking about a superpower where you're like five to 10 times stronger than your average human being all of a sudden. And it's be all because of um, the conditions that change in our world called the plasma apocalypse. Oh, I want to give a big shout out. Uh, it's uh, Julie's first time on my channel uh, joining us with the live stream. Julie Intrikin, good to see you. It's good to see everybody in the chat. What's up to Poland? I see Happy Coaster in the chat and some other people too. So check this out. This is the second video in this series. Okay, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be breaking down many of the superpowers that I believe we will inherit or or we will be gifted, however you'd like to to call it, after the apocalypse happens. Some things are introduced into this world that change the environment so drastically that it changes us right along with it, and we inherit superpowers. The first one we talked about was the stretchy superpower, <laughs> right? Where people, not not a lot of people, took. we took a poll. There's a poll in the chat right now to see what your uh, favorite superpower is, which one you would choose. I did a poll last time and uh, stretchy was not very popular, which kind of blew my mind. That doesn't mean that you have to have st stretched out skin or anything. It's elastic. It snaps back. You know what I mean? But hey, to each their own. If you don't want the stretchy superpower, that's totally fine with me. Let's talk about something more people will be interested in, which is super strength. And what I'm going to do is I'm not just going to talk about references to comic books or Marvel movies or whatnot, although I believe that those are excellent examples because those are based off of the historic examples that I'm going to share with you today. When real people in our hidden history, in our past that's been hidden from us or forgotten by us, real people were imbued with superpowers. They were called the mighty men of old, uh, men of renown, the Bible calls them. Also women. Women will inherit many different superpowers. Many women are actually going to have uh, be stronger in some superpowers than the men will. For example, telepathy. But well, that'll deserve its own video. Right now, what I'd like to do is... Uh, uh, welcome everybody who's brand new. Thank you so much for all your support. Thanks for joining my channel. I appreciate all the subscriptions and likes and stuff. Let me do some screen sharing with you. I'm going to read some interesting stuff here. We're going to look at some real life examples of superhuman strength. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're going to look at how it's physically feasible for this type of a thing to happen. All right, that is the correct one. Let's get on the right screen here. Boom. All right, cool. So the very first example I'm going to share with you all, this comes, okay, let me, let me slow down a little bit. I'm kind of excited today. All right. So, um, I started my truth seeking journey, uh, when I was a kid and I just wondered at everything. And as I got older and I, and I grew up and I came into the adult world, uh, people were offering their various religions to me. So, uh, Christianity and the Bible is where I started. It's what I'm most, um, studied in, I suppose. I've spent the, the majority of my years studying not just the Bible and Christianity and the biblical texts, but the extra biblical text, the texts that were not included in, in the official canonized final version of what we call the Bible today, which is a collection of various writings, right? Um, and not a lot of people know this, but there was a couple of times whenever those various sacred scriptures were put up for a vote to see which ones would be included in the official church recognized, you know, uh, scriptures or whatnot, right? Uh, and that, that gets into various councils and stuff like that from the early churches and Constantine and stuff. However, I'm not going to bore you with all that useless information. Not really useless, but uh, let's get to the fun stuff, right? Just like in uh, the Matrix, whenever Neo's sitting down for the first time, he's going to learn Kung Fu or whatever. Uh, his trainer tank is like, let's get rid of all this major boring stuff. Let's get right to the good stuff, right? So one of those extra biblical books, right? The first three I always recommend are Enoch, the book of Enoch, the book of Joshua or Yasher, um, and the book of Jubilees, if, especially if you're interested in what they call um, the pre-flood history, right? Or the um, anti 
uh, antediluvian age, right? When there was giants and heroes and superheroes and stuff that harkens back to the last red sky event that we had. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. One of those extra biblical books is called, um, the Testament of the 12 patriarchs. It's a decent sized book. It's not too long of a read. Um, but let me, let me give you a little history to it. In the Old Testament, you have, it starts off with the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve are born. There's a whole history and story there. But then where the book of Genesis focuses and the, uh, and the other books don't really is the firstborn lineage. It really follows the firstborn lineage of Adam and it follows his children, spe specifically his firstborn children. And, and what it's doing is it's focusing on his DNA, his stamp of his DNA that follows throughout the history of, of his lineage, right? Of his family. So that's why there's different accounts. That's why there's different versions of the book of Genesis. It's not really different versions. It's just different accounts that focus on different parts throughout time. Genesis focuses on the firstborn. Jubilees focuses on the timelines and uh, and the women, actually, believe it or not. Uh, um, Joshua focuses on, on the many different side stories, little uh, side quests, if you will and uh and details of of the major stories and um and Enoch focuses on Enoch of course uh Noah and the fallen ones the fallen angels and the giants and whatnot so the testament of the 12 patriarchs right you've got Adam had all his firstborn children all the way down to um um uh, let's see there's Abraham Isaac and Jacob. So I'm going to reference Jacob here in just a minute. But if we go back to Abraham's children, um, Isaac, oh no, I'm sorry, Isaac's children, there was Jacob and Esau. Okay, they were twins. Most people remember Esau as being the, the redheaded kid, right? The redheaded stepchild or whatnot. So um, let's see. I'm trying to organize my thoughts here. Um, basically, what I'm about to read to you, let me just go ahead and read it. Jesus, I'm rambling. Um, this is the, the the testament of the twelve patriarchs, right? There was there was twelve brothers basically, um, who were the sons of Jacob. I believe that's correct. And um, one of those children's name was Judah. I'm gonna read the I'm gonna read part of this account of Judah and show you that Judah had superpowers, but so did his other brothers. As a matter of fact, many of these patriarchs of the Bible, and I'm only talking about the Bible. This is this this is stuff that you can find all throughout every religion in their histories when they talk about the antediluvian epic or the uh, the, the age before the the great flood and the introduction of our ocean. So check this out. One of those children's name is Judah. I'm so sorry for all the rambling. Let me read what Judah says. He's writing to his children, right? Basically, this is the death note. This is the final letter. Um, these, these, these patriarchs were on their deathbeds, and these were a collection of letters that they had written to their children for posterity to say, hey, here's all my wisdom to my children and your children, right? So this is what Judah says. And the Lord showed me favor in all of my works, both in the field and in the house. I know that I raced a hind and I caught it. Now, a hind is a female deer, okay? So right away, Juna, uh, Ju Judah has super speed. He's able to race a deer. The, the average running speed or like the top running speed is, for a human is like eight miles an hour. It's not super fast. Uh, or that's like the average speed that we go, right? Humans don't go uh, as fast as animals. Animals are super fast, you know, many of them. But anyways, a deer could easily outrun a human being, right? Is my point. Judah says he raced, this is him bragging. He's like, I raced a deer and I caught it. I prepared the meat for my father and he ate it. And the, and the rose I used to master in the chase. I think that's another type of gazelle or something. And overtake all that was in the plains. So he's super fast already, right? Just like the flash, you've got people who are super fast. It's because of the increased muscle um, in comparison to the world we live in today. I'm going to break it down after this. A wild mare, that's a horse. I overtook and I caught it and I tamed it. So this dude can outrun horses. He can outrun deer. He goes on to say, I slew a lion and plucked a kid out of its mouth. That's a little baby goat. I took a bear by its paw and I hurled it 
down the cliff and it was crushed. I outran the wild boar. Mary, welcome to my channel. I outran uh, the wild boar and seizing it as I ran, I tore it in half. A leopard in Hebron leaped upon my dog and I caught it by the tail and I hurled it onto the rocks and it was broken in twain. So imagine this dude took, grabbed a bear by the paw, grabbed a leopard by the tail and is just tossing these amazingly heavy animals uh, into the air. I, and then he also ripped animals in half too, right? Just just tore them in, apart. It blows my mind. I found a wild ox feeding in the fields and seizing it by the horns and whirling it round and stunning it. I cast it from me and I killed it. <laughs> let's, let's see what else he did, okay? This is him bragging about all his feats. He's on his deathbed. He's like, hey, man, here's, here's who I am. Just like in, in our world today, right? Um, people are very big on, uh, you know, where they went to college and, oh, hi, I'm Jay Dreamers and I attended uh, Harvard University, went to MIT for eight years, uh, joined the Marine Corps, blah, blah, blah. People list their accomplishments, right? It's, it's not, there's nothing new under the sun. But when you live in the superhero age, the list of accompli accomplishments sounds way more impressive. All right, let's continue on. This is Judah. When the two kings of the Canaanites came sheathed in armor against our flocks and much people with them, single-handed I rushed upon the king of Hazor and smote him on the greaves and dragged him down and so I slew him. And the other, the king of Tapua, as he sat upon his horse, I slew and so I scattered all of his people. Akor, the king, and a man of giant stature I found hurling javelins before and behind as he sat on horseback, and I took up a stone of sixty pounds uh, weight, and I hurled it and smote his horse and killed it. Sixty pound boulder, right? He picked up a sixty pound boulder. I mean, on top of it, he mentions that he he jacked up a bunch of giants too. Okay, this is this is quite common. Right? You'll see that if regular people fight giants, there has, it takes a lot of them and they need uh, mechanical engineering. They got to figure out how to tie it or trip it or bring it down somehow. Not superheroes. Nah, -uh. no, 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 no. Superheroes go in for the fight because they have the ability to. So this guy picks up a 60 pound rock, throws it at another guy and kills him. He goes on to say, and I fought with this other two for five hours. I clave his shield in twain. That means he broke his shield in half. I chopped off his feet and killed him. And as I was stripping off his breastplate, behold, nine men, his companions began to fight with me. And I wound my garment on my, I'm sorry, I wound my garment on my hand. I slung stones at them and killed four of them. And the rest of them took off. And Jacob, my father, slew Bielasath, king of all the kings, a giant in strength, 12 cubits high. A cubit in today's standards is about a foot and a half, so that'd be about 18 feet tall. Um, however, there's good argument to be made that a cubit was actually much longer back when people were, were larger. And he says, I fell upon them and they ceased, oh, fear fell upon them and they ceased warring against us. This is Judah. <coughs> Excuse me a mighty man of old, a superman. This is where Superman and the legends of our comic books and our myths and stuff, this is where they come from. So that's very interesting. And there's way more accounts in there um, in this particular book. I just wanted to give you one example of these superpowers. Now check this out. Um, it says here that a normal deer can run anywhere between 35 and 40 miles per hour. And Judah says he runs faster than that, right? And uh, there was another one here too, where it talks about Neftali. Let me get in. I think it's in the next the next one here. Okay, cool. So this next reference is coming from the book of Joshua, as I mentioned before. And uh, Joshua goes into great detail, right? Whereas the, whereas the Bible and the book of Genesis. Uh, Exodus, Leviticus, they tend to leave out a lot of the details of the stories. So for example, when you read about Moses, 
um, after he leaves Egypt and you do the whole Moses, you know, in the, in the burning bush and the mountain and stuff, he's already like 80 years old. There's a lot that has happened in his life. The book of Joshua goes into great detail about those, those types of things. So in this particular instance, this is going to give us a little insight into a well-known biblical story where, um, where Jacob and Esau, the same brothers, right? Esau is the redheaded one. Um, they live, they live at home and Esau is going to inherit this birthright of the firstborn. Um, and, and it's a very popular story where he rushes into the house and he's totally terrified for his life. And he sees his brother making some soup and he's like, give me that as my last meal. I'll sell you my birthright. Right. It's a really weird, really strange story to sell your birthright for some soup. It doesn't really add up to me. Um, this fills in some of the details. So, uh, the story goes that Esau was actually out in the fields hunting when this mighty oppressor of old named Nimrod. Nimrod was also known as a mighty hunter. Nimrod was out in the fields with um, with some of his men, regular men, and two of his supermen, two of his mighty men of old, which means men with super strength, superpowers, okay? So Nimrod's out there. The supermen are like his bodyguards. Normally they stand by his side, but whenever he goes out hunting and he's in, in a certain area, they kind of leave him alone so he can walk around and be by himself. So it picks up right here. It says, and Nimrod and his men that were with him did not know him. And Nimrod and his men frequently walked about in the field at the cool of the day to know uh, and to know where his men were hunting in the field. Nimrod and two of his men that were with him came to the place where they were. When Esau started suddenly from his lurking place, drew his sword and hastened and ran to Nimrod and cut his head off. Esau fought with a desperate fight with the two men that were with Nimrod. And when they called out to him, Esau turned to them and smote them to death with his sword. Time out. Time out. Let's talk about that. There's four people with Nimrod, two regular humans, right? I mean, regular by comparison to who I'm about, about, about to talk about. Um, so two regular humans, his bodyguards, I guess, um, Esau handles them. Esau handles uh, Nimrod, which was probably the toughest one to take down unless he's, unless he got the surprise on him. But then he kills the other two, no problem, right? Doesn't talk about how there's much of a struggle or anything, but then listen to what happens next with the other two that were, that were not around, the other two supermen, right? It says, and all the mighty men of Nimrod who had left him to go out into the wilderness heard the cry at a distance and they knew the voices of those two men and they ran to know the cause of it. And when they found their king and the two men that were with him lying dead in the wilderness, uh, oh, and, and, and they found the two men lying dead in the wilderness. And when Esau saw the mighty men, you might as well say super, okay? When you see mighty men in the Bible, oftentimes it means supermen. Okay. It's the same exact word. Uh, I don't know why people don't say Superman, maybe because they don't want the correlation with comic books and movies and stuff like that. But I do because I see it as being one and the same or very similar to one another, I should say, right? One's a cartoonification of the other. So when Esau saw the Superman of Nimrod, coming at a distance, he fled and thereby escaped. And Esau took the valuable garments of Nimrod, which Nimrod's father had bequeathed unto Nimrod and which Nimrod prevailed over the whole land. He ran and concealed them in his house. All right, let me just explain that because that deserves a, a little bit of an explanation. There are um, special superhero kind of clothing, I guess you could call it, um, that are described as having been made for Adam and for Eve, right? When he died, he passed on this special clothing down to, to down to his uh, children and so on and so forth. Well, Nimrod had stolen the special clothing, basically, right? Uh, this clothing allows the, the wearer to be even more powerful. So Esau takes the clothing. He totally kills him, takes his clothes, takes off, runs back home. And he's terrified. He already killed the two regular dudes. He's not, he's not worried about that. He's worried about the Superman on his tail chasing after him. Esau took those garments and ran into the city on account of Nimrod's men. He came unto his father's house, wearied and exhausted from fight. And he was ready to die through grief when he approached his brother Jacob and sat before him. And he said unto his brother Jacob, Behold, I shall die this day. Wherefore then do I want the birthright? 
And Jacob acted wisely with Esau in this matter. Esau sold his birthright to Jacob, for it was so bought out, uh, bought about by the Lord. Okay, so basically Esau is like, I'm going to die. Like he knows he's going to die, right? He's got the supermen of like the mightiest empire or one of the mightiest empires at the time following him. They saw where he went. They're going to catch him. He's going to die, right? Because these super beings are chasing him and they have super strength. Let me show you another example. Uh, let's see. This one is, oh, okay. So this is also, this is a great story. All right. So if you remember the story of uh, Joseph and the multicolored uh coat or blanket or whatever the story is, right? In, in the Bible, you've got Joseph. Um, biblically, this is the story where Joseph was sold into slavery by his other brothers, which is the, the, the test, those patriarchs that I was just referencing, right? The 12 patriarchs, Joseph is one of them, right? And his brothers are the other 11. So anyways, they sold him into slavery in Egypt and um, they didn't really like him that much. Turns out he came to power, he became the most powerful man in Egypt underneath the Pharaoh, right? So uh, Jake, uh, Joseph's father is is pretty sad. He's, he has all of his brothers looking for them, even though they pretty much got rid of him, right? And they made up a story, you know, saying that uh, something had happened to him. And, and eventually the father was like, you need to go find him. Hey, Plasma Prophet, good to see you. Um, so anyways, they go into Egypt, they're looking for Joseph and they get caught. They, they're they taken to Joseph, but they don't recognize him. It's been, it's years and years later, he's a grown man. They don't recognize their brother. So there's an interest, there's a lot of really interesting dialogue that happens between Joseph and his brothers when they're right there in Joseph's court. He's doing great. And he has his brothers to thank for it, for selling him into slavery. That's the, that's the beaten road that led him to become the most powerful man of Egypt. So they're all sitting there in this huge dining hall of their brother. And uh, Judah, who we just talked about, who has these superpowers, starts getting into an argument with Joseph, basically saying, you're going to give us our brother or I'm going to kill everybody in Egypt. And he's not lying. He gives all kinds of reasons why he is capable of killing every single person in Egypt. Not an exaggeration. Uh, it's it's not, you know, <laughs> it's... It's, he's dead serious. So anyways, check this out. This is from the book of Joshua. It says here, uh, oh, they're basically arguing back and forth. Joseph basically tells him, oh yeah, you think you're the only one with superpowers? Try it, buddy. Watch, let me, let me read this. It says, and when Judah heard this thing, he was exceedingly wroth. That means he was pissed. And his anger burned within him. And there was before him that place a stone, the weight of which was about 400 shekels. And Judah's anger was kindled. He took the stone in one hand and cast it to the heavens and caught it with his left hand. And he placed it afterward under his legs and he sat upon it with all of his strength. And the stone was turned into dust from the force of Judah. And Joseph saw the act of Judah, and he was very much afraid, but he commanded Manasseh, his, his son. And he also did the same thing with another stone, like unto the act of Judah. And Judah said unto his brethren, Let not any of you say that this man is an Egyptian, but by doing this thing, he is of our father's family. So let me translate that, okay? You've got the superhero, right? The superman, Judah, who is in front of his brother, he doesn't know it's his brother. He's looking for him. So he thinks it's just some regular Egyptian dude without any powers. He's like, give me my brother or I'm going to destroy your entire city myself, right? Then uh, Joseph, who also has superpowers, is like, go ahead and try it, buddy. Look what my little kid can do, right? Because uh, Joseph breaks apart this huge boulder, boom, smashes it. And then uh, Joseph just has his son come out. And he's like, Hey, why don't you show him what you could do? Right? So he basically saying, if my son can do that, imagine what I could do to you. Right? This is a great argument. And then he says, uh, Joseph says, uh, and Joseph said, not to you only is strength given for we are also powerful men. And why will you boast over us all? And Judah said unto Joseph, uh, Anyways, that, that was pretty much it. I don't know why I highlighted all the rest of it. But anyways, isn't that an interesting account, right? Between two ancient and well-known superheroes, people with superpowers. Now, it's interesting because when you read these other watered-down versions, they don't go into all this detail about how they had superpowers. But when you read all these bib extra-biblical uh, 
like the pseudepigrapha and stuff, um, all these extra biblical accounts, they're not shy in throwing out the superpowers that these people once had. How about another ancient character, Gilgamesh? Gilgamesh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, that's mostly what he's known for. It's like, that's one of the oldest books in print is the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's a true story. Uh, they would, they would, academics would have you believe that it's like, you know, one of the first made up stories and it's just all symbolic and it's all metaphor and it's not, nothing really makes sense because it was so long ago. They don't understand that much of that was literal because the conditions in our world have changed so much that we can't literally understand the things that physically took place because the conditions are altogether different in this world. J. Joe, hey, welcome. So check this out. Here's only some of the abilities of Gilgamesh having super strength. And these are only small examples. If you look, there's hundreds upon hundreds of many examples of all kinds of people with super powers in times past. Sometimes it's a, a personification of uh, an electrical you know, phenomenon or something. Sometimes it's over-exaggerated, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's very literal. And I just got 50 bucks from LJ in the chat and a sweet sticker too. Wow. Thank you. I'm super honored. I'm so, I'm honored by all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you, LJ. I appreciate you. Um, so check this out. Gilgamesh, what, what kind of powers has he exhibited, right? First of all, actually, no, let me just read this. He carries around 300 pounds while traveling. You see that? That's, that's, that's said in these legends that Gilgamesh like put on a backpack that weighed like 300 pounds, right? That's just him carrying his regular luggage, you know, that he's, that he's like his backpack of supplies and stuff like that. He kills a giant in three hits, three times. And the giants is just dead. Enkidu, who is weaker than Gilgamesh. Uh, so in, Gilgamesh ends up making a friend. Um, Gilgamesh is a demigod. He is of the gods, Right. Um, Enkidu is more of a, a, a plasma apocalypse survivor who's more of a wild man, right, from the outskirts. Enkidu, who is weaker than Gilgamesh, holds a bull whose horns weigh 30 pounds down for Gilgamesh to stab it. So the dude who is weaker is also doing superhuman uh, feats of strength. Gilgamesh carries 30 pounds of horns presumably while carrying his 300 pounds of gear. He shatters the tackle of a stone boat in rage. He lifts and throws 30 yard long poles, presumably while carrying the 300 pounds of gear. So he, he, he constructs all these poles that are 30 yards long. Boom, starts tossing them, right? Endurance. Enkidu who Gilgamesh is stronger than, tanks an attack which cracks the ground. They walk 7 to 10 miles per hour while carrying 300 pounds of stuff. And here's another interesting one as well. Gilgamesh does not sleep. He doesn't need to. He is, it's, it's, it's widely known that Gilgamesh requires no rest. He doesn't go to sleep. He's that energetic, right? And this is something that I've referenced to as well, right? Whenever the energy fills this world, you don't need to, you no longer need to do the things that you do to get energy. You will be imbued with energy, right? Or as the Bible calls it, the Holy Spirit, right? I, this is my interpretation, obviously. Uh, when it comes to religion, people have all kinds of interpretations, but here's mine. So um, you'll be uh, you'll be highly energetically charged. You won't need to sleep. Okay, sleep will disappear. You'll sleep will be a thing of the past. It won't be necessary anyway because nighttime will be gone. There will no longer be a nighttime. It'll just be like constant uh, sunset type atmosphere, or um, what do you call it? Like right after sunset like twilight type of an atmosphere or just before sunrise. Anyways, you won't need to sleep. You won't need to eat a lot of food, if any food at all. Um, let's go on to the next thing here. So let's talk about how, how this can be applied. Let's talk about practical application of ancient comparative mythology, comparing it with modern times, right? This says that density is directly proportional density is is 
in layman's terms, it's, it's how solid something is, okay? Density is directly proportional to pressure and indirectly proportional to temperature. So let me slow down a little bit. Your body has a certain density to it, how strong it is, how solid it is, right? Your muscles, when you flex your little bicep muscle, right? However dense that is, is a good sign of, you know, how strong you are essentially, right? I'm, I'm not, I might not use all the correct terminology, but you follow me with what I'm saying, right? So the density of your body, also this applies to that as well. All your muscles, your skin, how strong and tight your skin is and stuff. Density is directly proportional to pressure. As pressure increases with a temperature constant, density increases. Why is that important for us? Because it means that you don't even realize it, okay? But you have been training your entire life under the harshest, harshest of environments, under uh, an environment in this world, this contained closed system of a world that we live in with all of its building, building, building pressure hundreds upon hundreds of pounds just weighing in on you from every single side, pushing you down, making things that much heavier for you to pick up. You're getting super strong. You're working on your super strength right now because here's what's going to happen. The world is going to depressurize. So what we just read, right? Conversely, when temperature increases with the pressure constant, uh, density decreases. Anyways, so with a, pre with a pressure decrease, right? When our world de decreases in pressure and there's rapid worldwide depressurization, <clears throat> that means that everything born into that world will be less dense than everything that came from the old age, which is our world that we live in today. What does that mean for you? What am I trying to say in simple terms? You know how like Superman like bullets bounce off of them and off of them and stuff and he's got super strong skin and and there's that's just one example. Superman's just the quintessential, you know, super strength superhero or whatever, right? You can use many of these people though. Um that means that you're going to be physically tough. If you survive the plasma apocalypse, you wake up into this next world, you go about surviving and and developing things and you you start your own little tribe and stuff. Other people are going to be starting their own tribes and stuff too. And all these children, generation after generation, because also you will live a very long time, okay? You will live to see your grandchildren's 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 grandchildren, uh, just like in the Old Testament in the Bible and all those patriarchs and stuff. Uh, they live to be hundreds and hundreds of years old. That's another superpower, which is long life. But we'll talk about that when we talk about the tree of life and the fountain of youth. But anyway... All of those subsequent generations are going to get weaker and weaker in comparison to you. You will be the superhero of the age, okay? Uh, you will be known. People will know because you, you, it will be difficult to hide it, okay? And for many of you, it's actually going to take practice in, under these new circumstances in, in a new environment. It's going to take practice on your part to try to control and figure out how to use your newfound abilities and superpowers in a changed world. Here's some examples of uh, things that have superpowers, basically, in our world today. These animals, right? So oftentimes we forget about how strong some animals are, right? Have, have you seen these pictures of like this uh, bull, these cows that are like pure muscle? Look at that thing, man. That's all muscle. And it, unfortunately, they breed them like that so that they can eat more of them. Um, this kangaroo, the jacked kangaroo, super strong and stuff like that. Um, let's read why they tend to look like that. This is um, myostatin, myostatin related muscle hypertrophy. So myostatin, I'm going to use that word a lot. So let me tell you what it means. Myostatin is something inside of the body that keeps your muscles from getting too big, right? And, and this is a, a precautionary measure because the body is very smart. The, the body and our DNA is very intelligent. It's, it learns to adapt on the fly, right? It, it, it adapts quickly to changing circumstances and environments, right? So, um, so for example, like uh, the stretchy skin thing, right? Remember, like in today's world, m many of you would not vote for stretchy skin. In the world to come, you might, especially if you're going to grow and get bigger and bigger, your skin needs to be stretchy to accommodate 
You know what I mean? You need you need to be able to do that. You need to to develop larger muscles and stuff like that. Anyways, myostatin related muscle hypertrophy, which it, that's a fancy way of saying uh, your muscles. This is a condition where your muscles just continue to grow. They're not limited by this by this chemical. It's a rare condition characterized by uh, reduced body fat and increased muscle size. Affected individuals have up to twice the usual amount of muscle mass in their bodies. They also tend to have increased muscle strength, right? That's in today's world. That's in the world that we live in today. I imagine in my mind, well, if if you can inhibit this uh, chemical myostatin, whatever it is, if you can figure out a way how that is inhibited in the body, then you would become super strong. You wouldn't even really have to work out or anything. Your muscles would just grow all by themselves. Um, and then also we have electrical muscle stimulation as well. Electricity actually helps to stimulate the muscles. There's many contraptions out there. Um, some are gimmicks. Some might be genuine and authentic. What's up, Paolo? I see you in the chat. Good to see everybody. Um, but there's many, many devices out there that use electricity to stimulate the muscles. So the muscles are kind of always in a state of like being slightly tense. Uh, it depends on, you know, the electrical charge, of course, but the muscles are constantly just like they're working out all of the time, right? So let me go ahead and take this down. Uh, let's see, where was I? This one? Yes. All right, cool. So imagine that, right? So we talked about the stretchy um, superpower. This one is something that most of you are going to get. I believe the stretchy one has, has more to do with like your proximity to the North Pole, how close you are to these plasma influxes and stuff like that, um, how, how it how your DNA responds to the stimulation and stuff. But this one is one that you're working on now. This one is one that will apply to almost every single one of you across the board. Now, some people are already being doubters in their own minds. And let me help you out, okay? I've heard of most people that I've, heard, that I've heard who don't really want the plasma apocalypse to happen, which is totally okay, okay? But many people are like, they see themselves as they are now, and then they put themselves as they are now into the plasma apocalypse scenario, like fighting a phantasoid, right? Many, many of you, if I talk about some giant bug looking alien creature, um, and you got to fight it and protect your town or your tribe or something, right? Most people are going to go, no way, man, because they imagine themselves now and how you are now and how you feel now. But what if I change the scenario? Just like what if we change the, the the environmental conditions, right? What if I gave you superpowers? What if I gave you super strength and skin that was difficult to even pierce or cut through? What if I gave you the ability to jump extremely high into the air, right? Um, because imagine we jump high right now because of our muscles, right? And this is, this is under an, uh, a decreased buoyant factor. Uh, buoyancy is severely decreased because of all the pressure in the world today. But when that pressure is relieved, buoyancy is increased. As a matter of fact, buoyancy is increased so much that things float at first. Once the world is finished depressurizing, then things float back down, but they weigh much less. Density is much less. And so therefore things weigh much less and there's still an increased buoyancy factor pushing up. Um, so it makes everything weigh that much less, but you retain your muscles. You retain that same, uh, form of density that you had from the world of today, right? So now when you jump, instead of jumping, I don't know, a foot into the air, most of you, right? You know, six inches, a foot or something, you're jumping like five, 10 feet up into the air. Some of you more. You know what I mean? That's why you have to practice your new abilities. You have to figure out uh, how to walk again and how to move and and how to treat other people because you don't want to accidentally crush some you know stranger or something when you're shaking their hand or something like that. Um, which is also interesting too. That could that could sort of be an origin of the certain secret handshakes and stuff, putting pressure on it, like how much pressure you can put. Anyways, um, so. Physical superhuman strength. What if you're fighting a phantasoid, but all of a sudden you could leap tall buildings in a single bound, a single jump, boom, you could jump right up into the air, 
All the other people are normal. They're not like you. They were They have muscles that are nothing like yours. Your, their, your bones will be more dense. They'll be more fragile. They'll be easier to fight. So some of these people, uh, Judah, Neftali, um, another one of those brothers, Neftali outran gazelles and stuff like that. Um, all of these mighty men of old, Samson was another good example, right? Uh, Samson in the Bible, obviously you've got many myths and legends about Hercules and Heracles and uh, Hercules' 12 labors and stuff and all the monsters that they would fight. And quite often, typically, I, I did this long video about monster hunters and stuff too. Many of you, right, that some of you will find up your place in this world and you will probably become monster hunters. Not all of you, just, you know, it's, it's only for certain people. But some of you will become monster hunters. You'll put your newfound abilities to good use. You'll be helpful in the community whenever the phantasoid menace arrives and there's bears and there's lions and stuff. And you can easily tear these things apart with your bare hands. Uh, so, some of the statues and stuff um, of antiquity, they depict these gods. Like some of them are referred to as gods. Some are referred to as demigods. I call them survivors and phantasoids, right? Phantasoids are those otherworldly beings that come in. Many of them might already have the same strength factor that you have. So they would be your equals. You know, some of them won't be. Some of them will be insanely weak and easy for you to, de to destroy. But many things that are born into that environment, into the new changed world after the depressurization event are going to be fragile in comparison to you, okay? And if you're worried about like, oh, well, I've got a bum knee or, uh, oh, my back's out or, oh, I'm handicapped or, oh, I'm, you know, all of those things, the legends indicate to people like me that you won't have to worry about that. Many of you out there will be healed, okay? And I'm gonna talk more about that factor when I talk about uh, the fountain of youth and the tree of life. It's going to heal, it's got a healing property, uh, the plasma specifically, the electromagnetics in our world, they energize everything, okay? So if you, you have to just change your mindset, mindset. Instead of being defeated in this hypothetical future in a post-apocalyptic world, um, because, because you're applying, you're projecting your current self, right? Which is, which is helpless in, in this system that we live in that invisibly handcuffs everyone and mentally handcuffs everyone as well. Um, don't apply the, the same circumstances to that post-apocalyptic thought because everything will be changed. Everyone will be changed. Now, I will also say this. In addition, what's up, Jojo? Good to see you. In addition to... Um, to, you know, like the good people having superpowers, right? Some of us will have super strength. Some of us will be ex extremely adept at telepathy, especially many women. Women are going to probably have a stronger te telepathic power because the world's energy is going to be feminine. It's going to have a, a feminine energy to it. Right now, it's got a masculine energy. But anyways, there will also be the bad guys that survive, okay? Not as many I like to believe, okay, my, my research indicates that there's a lot of this that happens is um is based off of energy and your vibes, <laughs> your chakra and your aura and stuff like that, right? But anyways, those of uh, those who have a, a an evil inclination who do survive, be careful because they will be your opposites. They will be the ones that you'll go against. They will be the ones that use their power for bad. They will be the ones that rally everyone together and they insist that they're the kings and they need to build an army. And you know what I mean? The, everything starts over all over again. And um, they will have, you will have opposition that has super strength, telepathy, all of, all of the different powers, stretchiness, maybe who knows. The stretchy one will be interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's my presentation for today. Do you guys enjoy this um, this little uh, segment, the superpowers of the apocalypse? I hope you do. Um, I, I really enjoyed presenting all of the realistic um, examples from history, historic examples of people who have superpowers. And I barely even scratched the surface just for the sake of time. You know, I just wanted to give out a few solid examples, but if you go and do your own research, you'll find many more than I've shared with you today. Hopefully it makes sense too. Um, keep, keep an eye out where 
in an upcoming video, we're going to talk about the tree of life and the fountain of youth. Okay. The fountain of youth is basically the ultimate Christmas tree of the world. And when you see that Christmas tree pop up out of the, the ground, um, or you see that beam of light, then um, that's when gifts are given. These superpowers are gifts that are bestowed onto the survivors. Okay. You deserve it, man. You lived in this world. You went through all of this crap. <sighs> Many of you are wishing that the world would change. And when it does, you will be given gifts unlike any other. Right on. Well, until next time. <clears throat> oh, go check out my website, please. Um, thank you to everyone who has donated and supported my work and my family and stuff so that I can continue to make presentations. Thanks for checking out the website. Uh, my website is super awesome. Check it out. Uh, my book, All About the Plasma Apocalypse, which talks about superpowers and all kinds of stuff, um, is available as well. And oh, I want to give a huge shout out. I want to give a shout out to some viewers that I have who sent me some stuff. Wendy and Sherelle. If you're watching, hello. It's good to see you. Uh, check this out. So they they make all kinds of interesting things. They have a company called Lazy Lizard Beadwork and they took some things like this one right here and they put it onto like a little slice of tree or something and they put a magnet on the back. So it's like a refrigerator magnet. And this is actually a picture that we all made, the Good Vibe Tribe and, and myself during our Masterpiece Mad Libs. This was the Mesopotamian wrappers in the back rooms. I don't know if you guys can see that that great. But it's really cool. It's all glossy and stuff. Uh, here's another one that we made that they turned into a, a little refrigerator magnet. See how it's got little tree bark on the sides? That's the survivors of the apocalypse. Here's a couple of examples of channel ones that they've done. And they sent all these to me. I've got like 20 different ones on the fridge. This one's got uh, Torque the Tardigrade and it says good vibes or goodbye. Sorry, it's not easy to see on the... The camera there it's kind of blurry and then here's another channel one that they made for me this one's awesome it's got torque and glyph down there at the bottom and a little valley of crystals and then i also got they make keychains and stuff too check this out they made me a keychain it's a little jdreamers keychain it's got my little jelly on there and on the back it's got my old school logo with the tree, the tree of life. So huge shout out to Wendy and Sherelle. Um, thank you so much for, for showing me how much I've inspired you guys or you girls. And um, thanks, thanks for all the support to you and everyone else. I really appreciate it. Until next time, I'm Jay Dreamers saying good vibes and goodbye.